what an excellent what an excellent morning, and we're going to carry on uh, uh, with another fantastic uh, speaker. So um, I, it's, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Neil Spensley. Um, he is going to deliver the Baus guest lecture for 2019. Neil's a paediatric intensivist and the head of the paediatric ICU here in Glasgow. He's also the Scottish patient safety lead, and he started out life in the Highlands, went west, and then via Edinburgh, Sydney, and Vancouver, ended back in Glasgow. I've heard Neil speak before, and I'm sure you're going to really enjoy the next half an hour on his favourite subject, which is workforce, uh, workplace behaviour. Neil, the floor is okay, yours. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, uh, good morning. So my name is Neil. I am 48 years old, and I'm married to Julie. Uh, and we have four children, which I have to say wasn't my idea. So uh, I have uh, a penchant for downhill mountain biking and uh, skiing, and I have two new ACLs to prove it. And in my spare time, I head up the ICU here in Glasgow, and I'm the National Patient Safety Lead for Pediatrics in Scotland. So about um, three or four years ago, we had a run of deaths, three deaths in quick succession on the unit, all of cardiac babies. And whilst that was upsetting uh, for all, it was very clear that during times of stress, certain simmering tensions just percolate to the surface and present themselves as poor behaviours. So let's just talk about that. I think I'll also tell you a wee story about my great uncle Neil, who I'm named after and who had a profound effect on me. And I'll end with this slide, which is, and I had the best seat in the house. So uncle Neil, even at 93, he had more hair than I currently have. Um, he was Regis Emeritus Professor of Organic Chemistry in the University of Edinburgh. He was a bright boy, and he loved his chemistry. But his real passion was people and running. And his best friend and training partner was a guy by the name of Eric Little. So he was very fast, except on a Sunday. And his exploits during the 1924 Paris Olympics were chronicled in the film The Chariots of Fire. So after these deaths, we had an external review. There was uh, various work streams put in place. I was put in charge of the culture work stream or the culture club, as it was affectionately known. And so we were very lucky to be able to have a chat with various people around the world about culture and behaviors within healthcare. And the first one uh, was a guy called Gary Kaplan. So he's chairman and CEO of Virginia Mason in Seattle. He was very good with his time. He phoned me up at home. Um, and I said, you know what, Gary, I am worried. I'm worried that we are alone. I'm worried that we are being talked about. I'm worried that we are an outlier. I'm worried that, and he goes, Neil, can I just stop you there? Because poor behaviors are omnipresent in healthcare. They're everywhere. Every department, every institution is probably the biggest patient safety problem that we have, and yet we don't actually talk about it. We then had a very long chat, uh, the group together, with uh, Lucian Leap, one of the first guys to talk about error in medicine in his JAMA article in 94. Uh, again, very good with his time. He didn't use the word omnipresent, he used the word pervasive. It's everywhere. So we discussed his five levels of disrespect. Uh, which he had thought about. Uh, and so number one is disruptive behavior, the shouting, the screaming, uh, throwing things. You kind of know what day you're going to have simply by seeing the red Porsche in the car park. Two is humiliation, mostly to nurses, the eyes, the ears, the advocate of the patient. Uh, three, passive aggressive. So these are the guys that I freely admit I have the most difficulty with. You know, when things are going well, it's I, my, and me. And then when they suddenly turn sir, it's he said, she said, you said. Did I? Whereas with the previous two, you can have that sort of camaraderie against the foe, but with these guys, they can create division, destruction, and doubt within teams, um, and they're very difficult to spot. And then four is just passive disrespect. I can't be arsed. I'm done. I'm not going to answer that email. I'm not going to answer the phone. Not malevolent, just done. And then five is patient disrespect. So we do this all the time. We're late. Uh, we don't write a prescription. We forget to do things. We interrupt, usually after about 18 seconds when the uh, patient will tell you quite eloquently what's wrong with them after about 90. What he didn't realize, though, was after a survey that there was a sixth level of disrespect, and potentially the most important, which is institutional disrespect. So not having the systems in place and the wherewithal and giving you the time and the training to in order to do your job correctly, which leads to frustration, which leads to anxiety, which can then spill over and lead to poor behaviors. And why is this important? Well, Disrespect inhibits collegiality, cooperation, communication, the very things that get you out of a jam when you have no plan. And of course, it's, and you may have seen this, it's learned and tolerated and reinforced by a hospital hierarchical culture. 
and good people leave. And good people remember. So this is an amazing slide uh, by Jerry Hickson. So he is a pediatrician in uh, Vanderbilt in University in the States. And he gets people to draw episodes of incivility. And this was drawn in a seminar, I think, around about 2007. So it's very clear what's going on here. There's no ambiguity. I think what's fascinating is it probably took two minutes to experience and two minutes to draw, but she could remember everything about it, including the date, which was 26 years beforehand. And it's not just the shouting and screaming that's problematic. It's amazing how little it takes to implode the confidence of an individual or an entire team. Uh, it's the tut, it's the swear word, it's the body language, it's the whispering, it's the well-judged silence. And yet we probably all do it, and we probably all pass that incivility on. And the price of incivility is pretty extraordinary. And in a survey, about 78% of people tied in incivility with morbidity of patient, and about staggering 27% with the death of a patient. And when you have the death of a patient or there's harm, then I suspect we've all experienced this. So this is Albert Wu's uh, initial paper on the second victim. So it was published about 17 years ago in a group of articles around about safety in the BMJ. Two things. One, it could have been written yesterday. Because, so has anything really changed? And secondly, and perhaps more interestingly, the guest editors for these publications on patient safety were none other than Don Berwick and Lucien Leap. Brilliant, brilliant guys who have uh, pushed the Patient Safety Forum and pushed the IHI. But who would have thought that actually the way that patient safety is portrayed at the moment, which is aiming for zero, dissecting people through data, minimizing variation, um, counting errors, and constraining people to not do things which are wrong, has potentially increased anxiety and potentially increased the second victim phenomenon. So who could have known that? Well, I bet you Eric Honagel knew that. And he knew that 17 years before then when he wrote his position paper on human error. And he's absolutely right. How can you blame somebody for doing something retrospectively, which at the time made perfect sense, even though you didn't conform to the rules? It's interesting, this term, isn't it? Um, how it's uh, being used more and more often. I mean, you have to help me out here. So this was judged upon two years ago in Glasgow. So where is enormous on that well-known scale of human error? Somewhere between the baffling and the blindingly obvious. But it is interesting how this is being used more and more often in healthcare, it's being used more and more often in society. Uh, people can now quantify just how reckless we were. But the fascinating thing is that if you ask the safety scientists around the world what their thoughts on it are, they don't really know what it means. Some say it doesn't exist, but they know what it infers if you bring the words human and error together. Of course, we don't help in healthcare because we use outdated linear tools that were you know, generated in the Industrial Revolution uh, and used by usually tired, knackered consultants and nurses with no time or training who are asked to find a single cause for an incident and then implement a raft of measures so it never happens again. Even though, weirdly, it's never happened before. And of course, in this world of increasing complexity, we just go back retrospectively and chronologically until we feel something and find something just makes sense. And we compress complexity and we construct a reason rather than actually finding one. And it's because we selectively and subjectively take superficial information and we reply it retrospectively to an incident that we were remote from. We add two and two together, we make five, and we blame the person most proximal in time and space to the incident, and we can relax. Hurrah! We found the cause. Our social anxiety can abate, the institution can take an immediate credit, and any further investigation that requires money or a system change stops dead. Yep. It was him, and we can move on. So we can blame, constrain, and retrain the highly trained, hopefully with more procedures and policies. You look at a lot of the procedures and policies that we follow, well, we don't follow them because they don't work, it's particularly in this environment. It is the most chaotic, complex environment in emergency department. And so we are wasting 15% of our time doing something that is of no clinical value. Because it came from National, why should they be telling us how to do our job and how to do it safely? And they didn't know what they were talking about because they'd never worked in store. 
In order to control people, you tell them what to do through procedures, through trainings, through surveillance, through reminders, through punitive measures. Somebody's failed to follow procedure, we need more procedures. And we need to punish the person or counsel the person for not following the procedure. What some of them have even done is declare a war on human error. And they try to stamp out individual human errors. And they try to manage the minutiae of their workers' behaviors and their acts and into the capillaries of their daily existence to try to manage and adjust and control everything that they do. Why? Why? Why are we doing this? It just makes them crazy. And we go crazy. So NASA realized that more of the same wasn't going to work. So the Apollo disaster happened. This is never going to happen again. OK, so Challenger, this is never going to happen again. And then Columbia. And what they realized was that we're focusing on the individual, the person, the uh, instructor, the engineer, the mechanic, uh, the supervisor, the pilot, and then implementing a technical solution for a non-technical problem just migrated the risk somewhere else and besides somebody else. And it had just happened again. So in their quest for aiming for zero accidents, they were actually beginning to miss the point. And in our quest for zero in the patient safety program, I suspect we're doing the same. So aiming for zero is, prob is problematic. You have the societal desire to aim uh, for, to quantify. We have a plethora of targets. And you know, zero is completely unachievable. And we focus on numbers and continuous improvement rather than the practices and the people behind them. So I think Bob Weirs is right. I think that patient safety has completely hit the buffers in its current form. The amount of investment we're putting into it is not commensurate with the amount of investment coming out of it. And perhaps in our desperation to be safe, whatever that means, we are in fact creating the very culture and anxieties that we are trying to eradicate. It's like the bureaucratization of everyday life. And to a certain extent, you can see why. I mean, this is published in 1948 in a time when the world was linear, in the time when, when the sort of systems were much more tractable. Well. And in fact, a lot of our systems are based on things that were, were occurred between 1940 and 1980. Nobody was talking any differently in 1948. Or were they? Because in the same year, there was another paper published, which at the time went largely unnoticed. And this is probably the first paper about complexity. And even then, Warren Reaver recognized that industry was very linear, but separate to that, living things were all varying simultaneously and in subtly connected ways. So in healthcare, we have a huge amount of variety. And as Ross Ashby says, in 1953, he was one of the fathers of cybernetics, only variety can absorb variety. And with people continuously creating safety, it seems a little bizarre that we're trying to continuously constrain them. And how we're doing that is we're imagining how people are working. So this brings us to Eric Hornagel's thoughts about work as imagined versus work as done. And as a good colleague of mine in Milwaukee, Matt, says, you know, policies and rules are often premised on work as imagined, so therefore unrealistic, untenable, and completely unreliable. So, hello, my name is Work As Imagined. And I can see where you've been making all these big mistakes, and I can see these big holes, these big errors that you're not paying attention to, and we're having all these events coming through and they're leading to patient harm. And that's a shame, but I'm here to help. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to block off all these holes, maybe the ones in the top right-hand corner, I'll add a few more layers of cheese, and I shall declare you safe from an office about, well, I don't know, three quarters of a mile away. Well, that's great. I am work as done, not work as imagined. And I know you're well-meaning, but that's pants, and quite a big beige pair at that. That's not our system. These holes aren't errors. They are defects in the system, and we know how to get around them. This is a static model. This is a linear model. If you were to come down to our world, this is what it would look like. We're constantly moving the bits of cheese around. We're opening and closing the holes, making up for a defective system, and we know how to do it. And we're constantly repelling hazards and errors. But if you introduce a new protocol or a new guideline or a new piece of machinery and then don't tell us how to use it properly and then shout at us and it overwhelms us, we can no longer compensate. And guess who is standing beside the incident when it happens? Well, it's not you. 
I suppose when incidents do happen, then the obvious question that we all ask is, why has this happened? And that's a good question, and we should ask that. But maybe we should be asking a different question, and that would be, why has this never happened before? What was it that the frontline staff were doing every single day in the same system that meant they were compensating every single day? And what was it that we did as managers which overwhelmed their ability to compensate for that system? And it brings me to the quote by Ernst Marx. He was the guy that lent his name to um, speed relative to that of sound, but he was also um, a philosopher. So it's knowledge and error flow from the same mental sources. Only success can tell one from the other, i.e. the origins of success and failure are the same. And if you constrain people's ability to fail, you constrain their ability to succeed. So I was quite worried about this, and I was worried that I was imposing stuff on the frontline staff that was making their job more difficult to do. <clears throat> so I went and spoke to Gail, who is the high queen of pediatric intensive care nursing, and I ran something past her, and she said, yep, you can do that, but one critical incident, and I will kill you. I will resuscitate you badly, and I will kill you again. And I said, <clears throat> okay, I get the message. So the following day, I was promoted from PICU consultant to PICU nurse. So this is Jenna in the middle, was a band five, my preceptor, now band six and richly deserved, and then Leanne the band seven. And it was a great day. I felt humbled, I felt fortunate, I made my first mistake within six minutes. I overread a chest drain by 100 mils. Now in a three kilogram baby, that's the fine line between removing it and cracking the chest. Jenna was amazing how she guided sick children and inept consultant throughout the day. And what struck me was that the ward round arrived at a time of their choosing, not ours, set four goals and then disappeared for quite some considerable amount of time, I have to say. Came back eight hours later, how many goals did we achieve? Three. Oh, it's a pity about that fourth one, isn't it? I was going, well, hang on a minute. You haven't seen the countless goals that have been effortlessly achieved throughout the day without the keys, without the drugs, with the person going off sick, with emergency admissions, covering the T's, and yet the only thing you're focusing on is the one thing that went negative. If you hadn't set that fourth ludicrous goal, we would have got 250 goals done. I must say it was an absolutely superb day, and I would encourage anybody uh, within the medical profession to do a nursing shift. And even though the light's in my eyes, I know who you are because the blood is draining out of your faces. So what was your greatest race? Oh, easy, Munich, 1922. So Eric and I were drawn together in the same lanes, in the middle lanes of the final, because we had won our heats. A huge stadium. Uh, we got into the blocks, we looked at each other, we said good luck, um, and we meant it. And then the gun went off and we went off. And it really was just the greatest day of, um, of my life. Interestingly, in healthcare, we don't look at the greatest things, and we don't amplify them, and we don't pass them on. We're obsessed with things that go incorrectly, and we dwell on them, and they're sporadic, and they're intermittent, and the amount of learning that we get by looking at them is actually minimal. Maybe there's a different way to be thinking about how to make our system far more resilient than it actually is. You can either invest in trying to preventing a specific type of event going wrong, which is what we normally do in safety and risk management, but you could also s say that the opposite of something going wrong is that it goes well. And you can try and invest in something going well, because if it go goes well, it doesn't go wrong at the same time. But if it goes well, it also increases productivity and efficiency and uh, maybe quality and a lot of other things. So your investment is not an investment to prevent something from going wrong. It's an investment in the functioning of the system of the organization. So it's, it's a positive investment. It's not a cost. So if it's going well, it cannot go wrong at the same time. And Eric has defined a thing called safety one. So that's look at why, why things went wrong. And that's the prevailing thing that we do in healthcare. But it's quite a slightly bizarre because we're defining healthcare and safe as the absence of safety. We're looking at it as the absence of things that go wrong. So whilst this is very important, he suggested we should be looking at something else, which is safety two. So that's looking at all events, why things went well, and why they went wrong, but in the setting of what normally works. And interestingly, if you look at it through a safety two lens, life and work and everything, you realize that the successful behavior is continuous and everywhere. The fact is that we just don't look at it and we don't examine it and we're not aware that we are completely immersed in it. 
And there's all sorts of fantastic things that are happening every day. It doesn't have to be an excellent instant. It can be anything. Sometimes the humdrum, the boring, the silent is happening all the time, and yet it is successful. So how do we get to know our system a lot better than we currently do? What well, it turns out is as simple as A, B, C, D. And I like this idea of asset-based community design. And that is that everyone in your unit, in your theatre suite, on your wards, in your family life, whatever, has a gift. And everybody has a skill. And everybody has a passion. And we need to try and find out what these things are, because these are the guys at the front line will tell you how your system is working and how to get around the problems that we encounter every single day. And it's interesting, if you look at so great leaders around the world, none of whom are perfect, it's often the little social things that allows people to define and find out who people really are. He had this unbelievable ability of remembering everyone's name. Obviously, he knows calf on reception and the laundry girls and the chefs and um, the cleaners. You've got 65, 70 players. You've got to remember all the names. Plus the schoolboys, that's another... 30 or 40. He knew all the names because he took an interest in what they were doing and how they were progressing. He was the top man, and if he's doing it, then everyone else should be doing it as well. Everyone loved him there in the club. He invited everyone to come for a lunch, uh, for a cup of tea, <laughs> English cup of tea. So it, 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 was a family. it was a family with him. And leaders often forget that, right? It, that it's just a, as much about the, the ladies doing the laundry uh, and making sure that they're happy as it is about making sure that uh, Cristiano Ronaldo is having a great day. So do you know the name of your cleaner in your ward environment, in your theatres, the place of work, and one thing about them that is not healthcare related? Because if it wasn't for Phyllis or the porters, our unit would be shut today. <clears throat> Amazing doing a, a cleaning shift, actually, because I gained a superpower. I hadn't seen that coming at all. Got my blues on, pinny, gloves, Titan sanitizer. Um, and then people who I'd grown up with in pediatrics for and known for 20 years who were visiting the unit just walked straight past me because the superpower that I had was the power of invisibility. And the only thing that I said to these guys was the thing that this silent workforce do all the time, and they would have done it to you too, and that is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. So what can you do when you go back? Well, I would start to talk about everyday work. Why is work working? Why is today successful? In fact, why did nothing happen? When I go to work at the weekend, the only thing that I know is my start time, 8 o'clock in the morning. That's it. And yet we intubate, we extubate, we put people in ECMO, we take them off again, we admit, we discharge, we transfer people from all over Scotland, we speak to people in GOS, Karolinska, sometimes in, uh, in Birmingham, and people all around the hospital. And yet when I come out at 9 o'clock at night, the majority of the time, nothing's happened. But why has nothing happened? And nothing has happened because your system performance has been extraordinary all through the day. Talk about what's strong, not what's wrong. We are immersed in success. Every pate is successful behavior, and yet we dwell on the one thing that potentially was pertinent to you that made you think that was a failure. Think about the crossing departmental boundaries. How can you walk in other people's shoes? How can you get to know them? How can they get to know them so they tell you information about how your complex system is actually working and not in a linear fashion? And don't try to be, think about what can be done to teams but think about what can be done by teams, because the answer is in the room, and they will give you the answers about how they are negotiating this complex system, and yet we are being constrained with linear tools. And I think safety, the word safety, has probably had its day. You know, we're aiming for the wrong thing. What we should be aiming for is system performance. And as Eric says, that's <clears throat> going to increase your quality, your safety, uh, your efficiency, and maybe even your well-being. You know, I think you can probably go to a thousand well-being lectures or empathy training or this, that, and the next thing, and it's probably going to be just short-lived. What we probably need to do is think about how emerging complexity is being constrained by elderly systems, which is creating anxiety and burnout. And the only way that we're truly going to make a difference is if we examine our system using a totally new way. People often ask me what my um, definition of safe is, and the answer is I don't really know. 
But my sense is if people want to come to work and raise their hand when they're worried or are happy to tell me how they got around this system and it perhaps wasn't based on a rule, well, that probably makes us a bit safer because we live in a complex socio-technical system and we need to have the ability to create a dynamic, interactive communication. So allow people to use their expertise and their experience to put a work around in, to have a plan B and to manage surprise. There's only one thing that we truly know about our system and that is at some point it's going to do something that we hadn't thought of. And of course things that have never happened before, well they happen all the time and yet we cope. There's no CEO starling here. They're not following some 10-point strategic flocking plan, but they are managing a social system very elegantly. If you put them in a pen and introduce a hawk in there, I'm not entirely sure that this is of any use in my world anymore. There's no sort of magical ECMO machine or surgical technique or medicine or uh, transport helicopter is going to change the face of medicine anytime soon. And anyway, emerging science technology, the interface between that and the patient for now is human. Perhaps we need to move away from the feeling of humiliation. Perhaps we need to show a degree of humility, maybe even humanity. Or maybe simply we need to be humble in the presence of others, irrespective of their role. So did you win? No. No, I was second. I said, no. Well, who won then? Oh, Eric did. Yeah, he won by an absolute country mile. So I'm puzzled. You said it was the greatest race of your life. And he goes, yes, it was. There was 20,000 people in that arena, and where I was drawn next uh, to my best friend in the final. Uh, as we got into the blocks, we said good luck, the uh, audience and the crowd was quiet, we could hear a pin drop, and then the gun went off and we went off and I was fast. You know, I knew I was fast, I felt fast. But at the same time, just there, stretching out in front of me, was the most elegant and effortless runner the world had ever seen. And I had the best seat in the house. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that was um, absolutely masterful. We've got a coffee break, but uh, if uh, uh, Neil's quite happy to answer a couple of questions, if there are any questions from the floor, please uh, make yourself known and just answer a question, and he'll try. I'll be here for coffee as well. <laughs> Hi, uh, Hi, Lauren Stewart from from Edinburgh. I thought that was marvellous, and we've all recognised much of that. I just wonder what advice you'd give to Boeing at the minute, and they have screwed up so badly with their, their MCAS and killed 163 odd people. Yeah. I mean, I think being honest, I'm not sure they've been open and honest uh, early enough. I think that's one of the things that I have sort of certainly noticed. Um, I think moving forward for safety, then again, you could redefine safety as looking at what has gone well. So they've got a lot of successful stuff in there, and they, they need to sort of you know, talk about that as well. But I think it's just being open and honest. The minute you think that there is an issue, a problem that's affected staff because of your behaviors, that the system has affected staff, or you know, has uh, gone on to the patient, then honesty is the best policy. And I've changed the way that I think about now. I used to sort of stand back and be worried or embarrassed or anxious about going to parents if there was a drug error or an accidental extubation. But actually now, the minute anything like that happens, you just sit down, be open and honest, tell them what happened. And I now change the, the way I say it. I say, look, this, we would tr this is never going to go away. We're never going to have an error-free day. But what we can do is we can try and mitigate those errors as best we can. And the way we do that is we look at things that go wrong, but we also make sure that every day most of the medications um, delivered are successful. Most of the tubes stay in successfully. So we look at that as well. And it's interesting, just changing the way that that discussion, they kind of get it. Um, but I think early honesty is the absolute key. And I don't think Boeing did that. Uh, thank you, Stephen Mark from uh, New Zealand. Uh, right. I'd like to thank Duncan for a masterful choice of a, a lecturer, but secondarily, someone who is so clearly understanding safety still undertakes downhill mountain biking. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> where do you? Where are you working in New Zealand? I was just. I was in New Zealand in October. I lived in Tauranga for four months. Yeah, you picked a good spot. Yeah, uh, it's Christchurch. We've uh, settled down. All right, yeah. So I know Carl Horsley very well. So he's an adult intensivist in Middlemore. 
and I went mountain biking with him, and uh, and he works in the spinals unit in um, in Middlemore. <laughs> so yeah, it's. Uh, but the, do you know the thing about it is though is that mountain biking and skiing, I find I can completely disconnect from life. You know, I can't think about work. I can't think about system behaviours. I can't think about you know my children costing me a fortune. You know, I have to focus. I have to completely disconnect because if I don't, then I will be in Carl's spinal unit, which I'll try and avoid. Hi. Um. Ah, um, hi, how are you? Tom Clark, medical student. I hey. was um, really impressed that you crossed the boundaries between different fields and what you were speaking about, understanding the other professions and putting yourself in other people's shoes. I was intrigued because all I see is that from the day you walk into medical school, there are actually already divisions between the student bodies of what will become the professions. And I'm intrigued to hear what you'd say as to how we can be expected to function as a cohesive team once we're actually working, when we can't even do it when we're students. Yeah, no, and you're absolutely right. And we talk about this in uh, sort of about nurses as well, because nobody else does this, you know. So we train in two different camps, and then we come together on day one and expect it to work as a team. There's this glass ceiling, which the nurses are told very clearly that you cannot go above, and yet the consultants are tap dancing on the top of it. Um, so although we go into battle together, you know, with uh, against disease, sometimes we couldn't be further apart. So you're right, so um, in here, I'm starting lecturing um, on this in medical schools um, and just bringing the idea that, you know, ICU for me and you know, your urology teams, et cetera, is a small society. And how do you get that society to work? Well, it's like the asset-based community design. Everybody has a skill, a gift, and a passion. And they will have a skill set that you need in order to get the job done that you don't have. So it's important to sort of think about it in those sorts of terms. You're right, I mean, it's historical. It's been like this for years. We're not going to change it overnight. But I think looking at things that go well and making sure that you have that sort of humility and that sort of humbleness that the people in your room will have the answer. And if you tell them what to do, it's likely that they may actually make a mistake rather than actually make a good judgment. If I may follow up, do you think that there should be a position in the curriculum for medical students being placed in other healthcare positions to gain insight into them in the curriculum? I think uh, definitely do nursing. Um, if you are going to do one thing, do a nursing shift. Because that tweet that came out the other day, which is great, you know, your four years of medical school, don't you know, make sure that you don't substitute that for 20 years of nurses' experience. You know, nurses have got me and patients out of an enormous amount of deep water. Um, and it's only by having that sort of you know, communication, that open communication, because that's really, if you're gonna talk about system performance, that's what it is. It's all communication within your whole system, the hardware, the liveware, the software, um, and it's just that open communication which gives you the information of how it's working. But the, the nurses know how the wards work and how the theaters work. I don't, you know, and I realized that when I did that nursing shift. So do a nursing shift. Fantastic, thank you. No worries. Many thanks for, for the talk. Um, I wonder if you could possibly give maybe one example of how you've translated these profound insights into the working life in your own department, maybe one that you're most proud of or the simplest change you've, you've created. Well, I, I think that the things that we're, I'm involved in now um, is a thing called um, Learning from Excellence. I don't know if you've seen that. So Learning from Excellence is a positive reporting system that was generated by Adrian Plunkett who is the, my equivalent in PICU in Birmingham Children's. So you can look up the website, learningfromexcellence.com. And what we've realized is that this was learning from positivity and positive reporting. But we've actually realized that this is actually sort of a covert way of gaining intelligence about how your system works. So instead of, you know, I talked about work as imagined and work as done, there's that gap. And what people think to make it safer is that you close the gap um, and then you work as other people imagine. But what we should be doing is examining that gap. How are people getting around an intractable, difficult system that doesn't work every single day and then amplifying that? Um, the thing that I really want to do um, is, um, well, so all my fellows have to do nursing shifts. I've had four consultants who came who have done nursing shifts. Um, and possibly the most proud moment was when two of the cardiac surgeons, it was actually two weeks ago, took a selfie with Phyllis. Um, and they now know her name, make her a cup of tea, uh, because they realize the value that she has within our unit. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat>